my father took my brother and myself in his arms and walked, a, walked across the Brooklyn Bridge. From Manhattan, he walked from Manhattan to Borough Park in Brooklyn, to the infant's home. He, he had a business which he had to attend to and he saw that his wife, my mother, couldn't take care of us. She was insane. But the funny thing, my father had two wives, my mother and the previous one. The previous one couldn't conceive, so he divorced her. He got to get. And he married my mother. And he, he got two children. My mother's name was Sarah. My father's name was Nathan. His second wife, his sisters, uh, my, my mother Sarah, Dinah, Anna, Cyril, belonged to a family that owned a dry goods store in Warsaw. Oh. So they, do, they were doing very well. And my, there is a story called Myla 18. Yeah. It was on Myla Street. And that's apparently was the uh, business district, or at least the Jewish business district of, uh, of Warsaw. My father had to give us up. He couldn't take care of us, run his business. By the way, his business was, he, it, it was a style to make pocketbooks out of metallic material. And that's what he did. He made pocketbooks out of metallic material. And uh, he couldn't do both take care of us. So he he probably checked around to find out where the nearest orphan home was. And he brought us, he brought me and Lenny to the nearest, at least him, at least to him was the nearest orphan home, infant home really. And he carried us across the Brooklyn Bridge, deposited us to the administrator and dropped it. And that's what happened to my father. I was just about maybe two years old, maybe under two even, because I do remember events that happened in the infant home. I don't, I don't know <laughs> what age I was, from two to six. And I remember we used to play in the playground in, in the infant's home, a dirt playground. I remember my, my grandfather visiting me outside the fence to our playground, and I recognized him. I don't know how we got to know each other. He recognized me, of course. He lived with his daughter, Dinah, my aunt Dinah. She took care of him. Mm -hmm. And every time he came, he would give me ice cream. A, a pop of ice cream. Mm -hmm. When I was six years old, you have to leave the infant's home. Your family has to take you out and take care of you or do what they do what they can to take care of you. I went I went on a bus, on a city bus, I remember, and I can't remember what happened to Lenny. It's beyond my ken. But I remember I went to my cousin Natalie's house to live. And on the way to my cousin Natalie's apartment. In Brooklyn? In Brooklyn. I cried so much because I didn't want to leave the home. I was. 
having a, a good time there. In other words, it wasn't cool, it wasn't depressing. And I was one of the kids and I enjoyed myself running around. They told me shush, but I kept on crying. And what happened after I went to Natalie's house, I don't remember really. I don't remember the circumstances. But after my life, maybe I was only there a couple of weeks, a short time, a short time in that, in that little house. She was a cousin, a first cousin. And she got married to Jack, and, and she lived, I forget where, then. She lives in Brooklyn. And what happened after that is unclear to me. But I remember living with Natalie again. Oh, no, no. I, I remember living at that age also with Betty, my cousin Betty, who was Natalie's sister. They called the apartments. They lived in a development. In those days, I had a development. And I, I think it was called the Hillside Apartments. And I was so happy to live there. I, I, the reason I was happy is because I had seen heat. I don't know why. <laughs> I never, I don't know, I don't know why, I never, I never felt cold, but it made me secure, having seen it. Every morning it would come up, I wouldn't be cold. Well, I went with Betty, Betty with Betty, right, and she was married to, uh, he was a, a razor. Gillette Razor Salesman, who went from door to door, you know, store to store, pushing, pushing Gillette Razors. Gillette Razors was number one, because they always advertised. And they had one son. I forget her, his name. I met him years later. He wasn't friendly at all. I don't know why. But I remember one instance that I used to go shopping for, uh, for Betty. She would give me some money, send me to the local store for some bread or milk or whatever. And then I wouldn't give her the right change. I would, I, I would keep some for myself. <laughs> That's what I remember. And I ended up living in Brooklyn in Bensonhurst. And I started school there, PS48, I remember, that was the name of it. I started grade school. I think I was living with my aunt, Anna, Kenny's and Ernie's mother and father, Jack. And was she the sister of your mother? She was the sister. From there, I lived with Joseph, and, and uh, Esther, my mother's sister. And he had a butcher shop and chicken shop. He had one, one location up in Fleischman's, New York, the Catskills. And he had, in the winter time, he went to Florida and he established a butcher shop and a, chick, and a chicken, he sold chickens also. He was at the end of, of um, Miami Beach, just where it started, like First Street or whatever. My cousin Jack would drive the truck and, and, and um, Joseph, my Uncle Joseph would, would, fit, would sit with him up front and 
Esther and I were sitting in the back under blankets so we wouldn't get cold. And that's how we went to Florida. When I lived in Miami, Miami Beach, I used to go to the beach every day. I used to have a lot of fun at the beach, in the water, and that was after school, because I used to go to school there, first grade or second grade. And it was 10 blocks from where I lived at the end of Gosh. Miami Beach up to the school. I think the school was on 10th Street. 10th Street is still there. It's a very famous street in Miami Beach. Yeah. I can remember that it, it, there was a girl in my class. Listen to, listen to me. Don't get jealous, bro. <laughs> the girl in my class, beautiful girl, maybe eight, maybe seven years old. How old could be eight years old? She was beautiful, and her name, I still remember to this day, Honor, H-O-N-O-R, Boyd, Honor Boyd. Mm -hmm. And just maybe 20 years later, or 50 years from earlier, or maybe longer, I remember seeing Honor Boyd, who became a model. <laughs> She was so good looking, and that, and I, either I, I walked to school in the morning or I took the the trolley. It was a trolley, but most of the time I walked. Oh, what a walk! Ten blocks. <laughs> I hated that walk. It was so tiresome. We stayed there all winter. Of course, it's the warm weather, and people will come down. And then, if towards the summertime, we would go back up to Feisman's again, and he would open up his butcher shop. I was good in the chicken business. I, I used to say, Irving, go upstairs and get me a two and a half pound pullet. I go upstairs and look at a, a, a chicken. I knew it was two and a half pounds. And I would catch it. I'd go in front of it, shoo it away, and grab it from the back. That's what I would do. In the chicken house, they had a house in the back where the chicken was laid, lay eggs, and I would get the eggs and bring them into the kitchen. And somebody would candle them because okay. you can't sell fertilized eggs in the Jewish establishment. I don't know why they did succeed in Fleischmann because nobody would pay their bills. Mm -hmm. They went broke apparently. Uh -huh. A year or two later, we lived. We went from the Fleischmanns to live in the Bronx. One of one of my aunts, one of my one of the daughters of my aunt uncle was called Molly, very good looking girl who was married and lived on the Grand Concourse. So I remember that I used to bring the food to Molly because apparently Esther was a good cook and supplied some food to Molly. I remember Molly's husband was a a rug salesman, and while I was living in, in the Bronx, we lived in a ground floor apartment, and I had a, it wasn't a bed, it was a, a large chair, a leather chair, in the foyer as you come into the apartment. And I remember them feeding me at times for dinner, uh, rye crisp. <laughs> and that was it, huh? That, that was, was it. it. Um, but I remember Lucille, their daughter, who lived with them, who was a single. She used to make me 
bagel sandwiches with lettuce and tomato and mayonnaise. That I like. <laughs> she was good to me. We were friends in the sense that she liked me very much. I was attending school with my, in the Bronx, and um, I think I was in the fourth grade. I was in the fourth grade, I remember. And I was doing very well in school. I, I, liked, I liked school. And after school, I would play football, believe it or not, on a rocky lot <laughs> in the Bronx. I was a good reader. I was a very good reader. I used to read everything. I used to read the journal, New York Journal. I used to read the comics. I was very, very smart in the sense that I could read early. Once you were read early, you were a smart kid. And then, all of a sudden, they take me to the home and say goodbye, and that's it. This was, I was nine years old. I was born in 26, it was 1935, in the middle of the Depression. I enjoyed the home very much. I liked the home. Some of the monitors and the supervisors were cruel. They would hit you, things like that. But you, stay, you, you try to stay out of their way. And for discipline, they would take the whole dormitory and stay in us in the middle for an hour or two. Just stay in the dormitory for discipline. In the home, there might have been 250 kids. We had three sections, the freshmen, the um, juniors, and the seniors. I was a freshman when I went into the home. One thing I remember about the freshman dormitory all young kids, nine years old, maybe ten years old, maybe eight years old. And one Christmas, when I was there, we woke up in the morning and there was a toy under our pillow. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was so exciting. And I remember the monitor, or the supervisor, a monitor. Really, of course, he was part of the home. He was a senior, and he supervised us, and he got the toys for every kid under our pillow. We, we were so happy for Christmas. To imagine nine, nine years old knowing about Christmas, but knew about Christmas. We had a set of classes on a on the third, on the third floor, from from the public school system of New York, they supplied the teachers, hmm. they supplied the material, and after the eighth grade, you went to a local high school. It's a home. You went to synagogue twice a day, in the morning and in the after, late afternoon. We went to Hebrew school. There were two Hebrew school teachers. We went to Hebrew school every day. And we went to synagogue twice, twice a day. We were Jews and went through the ritual of going, going to Cheder and having a Jewish education every day. After school, you spent an hour in Hebrew school. Our promise was very, very nice. What happened was, once a year, those kids who turned, who turned 13 would go to a big dinner in one of the local hotels in Manhattan. Really? Like I, when I was 13 that year, all of us went to the Hotel Astor. Mm. And we sat on it. A dais and everything. And we had an entertainment. We had Jimmy Durante. He entertained us all. It's a fundraiser. That's what it is, really. Well, they said that I was going to go to a foster home and live with my brother. 
that was all right with me. I, I didn't know anything. And they gave me a, a valise with some clothes in it and told me how to go from Yonkers to Brooklyn. All by yourself? All by myself. <laughs> I was not. How old was I? Uh, I was 13. I think I was like, oh yeah, I was 13 years old. And my friend Sam, Sam Marcus, he always been my friend throughout my life. He, he, he looked at the map and he said, well, where were you going? What's the address? I said, West 6th Street in Brooklyn. West 6th Street. I said, West 6th Street, 1342, West 6th Street. So he looked at the map and he said, here's what you do. You take the train all the way down, because there was a stop on the transit called West 8th Street. So he said, you take the train down to West 8th Street. That must be, you get it off, that must be <laughs> close to West 6th Street. But lo and behold, it wasn't. <laughs> what an experience. So West 8th, West 8th Street was in Brighton Beach. And I had to go all the way up to Bensonhurst, which was a long walk. So, what I do, I started walking along McDonald Avenue. I figured I'll go that way, so I'll find my, my way. And while I was walking with the police, a guy with a, with a car stops. I, he says, where are you going? Young man, I told, told him where I was going. He said, oh, let me drive you up to wherever you you. Avenue U was a main road in, in Brooklyn at that section. And so I went to Avenue U, he let me off, and I walked all the way over to West 6th Street in Avenue U. Then I walked all the way from Avenue U up to Mrs. Maplin's house. And when I finally got there, I was exhausted. I must have spent a couple hours walking. And I, when I got to the house, they opened the door. I started crying. I was so, so miserable. I was so happy to, to see a familiar my face. But how, how could my brother be familiar? I haven't seen him in years. She had another force kid named Harvey, Harvey Shallow. We all became friends. And Mrs. Madeline, she, she treated us like her own children. She was so, Mrs. Madeline, all mothers should be like that, really. The way she was. Very progressive woman. That the latest appliances she had a two-family house upstairs with a family called Chira, C-H-I-R-A, Syrian Jews. Mm. And downstairs, we lived in down, downstairs, in five of us. They had two <coughs> bedrooms. And we, the three boys lived in one, and, uh, Mrs. Madeline and Abe Madeline lived in the other. Then they had a kitchen, a little dining room, and a big dining room, then a living room, then a front porch. That's what they had. A nice house. And the one bathroom for all of us. We didn't consider that so bad. <laughs> and we only took a shower once a week. On Saturday, the day you took your shower, you uh, you were uh, was Saturday. 
and you wore the clothes all week. And I knew my socks were so dirty, when I took them off, they would stand up. That's the way it was during the Depression. Apparently, we were no different. Same clothes all week. I was 15 years old. It's a bad one it's because she got sick. And I went to live with her daughter for a couple of years because she told her children that they ought to take care of us. Norman and Douglas, they were the two children. I forget the daughter's name. In fact, the, the uh, husband was called Arthur Osman, a very famous um, labor leader mm. in, uh, in Manhattan. Very famous. I lived there for a couple of years. She took care of me in the sense that she, she fed me. She treated me like one of her children. Lenny went to work for uh, Smiling Brothers, one of the fruiterers, a chain fruiterer in New York area. So he became a fruit man. He worked in a store. And I would work there weekends. I would work there Saturday. I was a, I was a kid. Uh, I was the treasurer. You know, I took care of the money. I made the, made the, the deposit to the bank in the store around Lenny. Lenny, they had three stores in one area in Flatbush. The, the Smiling Brothers, and I would work every Saturday on one or the other. I was going to Lafayette High School, and the daughter lived out of the district. Mm -hmm. But they, but the daughter knew that how long would I live there? So I always take a, a, a long bus ride to Lafayette High School. It was difficult for me. I didn't go to the army right away because I had a bad eye. I had 2200 vision in one eye and normal vision in the other. Why? What was wrong? With, were you injured? When I was a kid, seven years old, living in Fleischmann's, me and another guy were shooting BB guns and he got me right in the eye. And from that accident, I I was 2200, I couldn't see out of that eye. All I can see is, I can see two fingers, three fingers, but I couldn't see well. So it kept me out of the draft until they really needed people in, because that particular draft board didn't have enough young men to go into, to meet their quarter to go into the army because at that time they had the Battle of the Bulge, which mm. the Allies were defeated so badly by the Nazis. So they took more people and they took me in and they made, put me in a medical, medical corps because they didn't think I could shoot a rifle. But I did shoot a rifle. I did very well. I was a very good rifle shooter. I took basic training in Camp Crowder, Missouri. I was in the medical corps as a clerk. When the war was over, they started discharging people and I was discharged from the army. Then I went to Brooklyn College under the GI Bill. I don't want to go anyplace else because I was friends with Lenny, and I became friends with his friends also. Lenny and Danny lived in a room on the top floor of a Victorian house with, with a couple named Mom and Pop Edelberg. And I went to live there 
with mom and pop Angelou Berg, and we lived on the top floor of, a, of the Victorian house, and three of us lived in one room. I worked for the Department of Welfare, very low paying job. But I, I didn't go into law, I didn't go into any specialty, just the Department of Welfare. They called my job a social investigator. Ruja and Ruga. You were born Ruja. T tell us how that got changed to Ruga. I don't know. The issue is our name. We said Ruga. But the thing is, our name was Ruja. R-U-J-A. Which is a Polish name. I don't know how I got the name Ruga. Lenny got the name Ruga also. No further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Good job, everyone.